Males first, and we're going to make this little chart. You got your X's, that's your data, your pieces of data. You have uh, your X minus X bar, because these are samples, so we're using X bar instead of U. And then you got X minus X bar squared, just where you take that, each of these numbers, and you square it. Somebody help me off, or help me out there looking at the book, read off the, uh, actually let's put the numbers in order. What's the lowest male score? Uh, 1,933. 1,033. Give me another one. Next one. Department teachers for the direction at this time, if we could get all students that are going on the yearbook field trip to the office, please. Thank you. 380. Right? Um, Molly Molly mixed them up. So we got this. Those of you who are going, make sure you do that assignment if you have trouble. I'll try to put this video showing you how to do this stuff. And, and it will also show today's stuff. So hopefully I'll get it on uh, Moodle here soon. 15 is the next one. Calculators, add them all up. What's a good SAT score? I, I think eighteen hundred is is okay. Is what do you think is an okay SAT score? <laughs> yeah, it depends on what school. I, I scored I scored a twenty five, so I figured. Anything higher than 75 is pretty good. Normally, I would put this at the bottom. I don't have room at the bottom. We're summing all these up. <coughs> Make sure you're doing this. Those of you maybe not understand this stuff so well, this has got to be focused. Thirteen one four four. I like that we didn't even say that they're really good. Oh yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. There's a T. There's eight of them. We want to find the X bar. That's actually part of our answer is X bar. So we take that number and we divide by eight. Sixteen forty three. Sixteen forty three. So that's telling us that the mean score for males. 1643. Now what we're going to do, somebody start towards the bottom and work their way up. Some And some of you, we should have enough people in here that everybody could do like one or two of them. And that way we can go a little quicker. We do the X, the data piece, minus the 1643. So somebody tell me this first one. Negative 600. Negative 600 what? 10. How about this one? 1380. Negative 1523. Yeah.
Now, if we start to square these, somebody square this first one, negative 610. Knowing when you square it, it should be a positive, right? Do we really want to write down all these numbers? Because these are going to be big, aren't they? The only ones that aren't going to be you know, really, really big are like maybe these three right here. All the rest of them are going to be pretty big numbers. And that's a lot to write down. So that's where, when I did mine, I put it in the calculator in one of the lists. And then let the calculator do all the work. So if you went through on your calculator, they don't even have to be in order on the calculator. The calculator will actually order them for you if you want it to be in order. But when I did it, all you do is hit stat, edit, and I think I put this one on list three on my calculator. I got 1520, 1750, 2120, does that sound like the right group? So I just stuck it in there. And then all you're going to do is hit stat, go over to calculate, one variable stats, and you put in, I put, I put them on list three, so I hit uh, list three, and it gives me all the stats. It gives me all the stuff that I'm looking for. Now, if you are doing this out longhand, for some reason, maybe I'm a jerk on the next test, and I say you have to do it out longhand, instead of writing all these numbers down, all we really need is the sum. All we really need is the sum of this set right here. So what I would do, try this on your calculator. Do we really need the negatives? What's going to happen? They're all going to turn to positive. So on your calculator, just take each one of these numbers, hit square it, and then hit a plus, square it, a plus, square it, plus, square that number, plus, square plus squared, plus squared, plus squared, then hit equals. So do that real quick on your calculator. Punch in each one, squaring it, forget the negatives, they're going to turn to positive anyway, and just add them all up, all as one group. Say it one more time. <coughs> Eight one five three four two. My number is right there. It is? Okay. I don't know. Somebody else? Six parents squared. This is one of the things, when you get one of these numbers, does it hurt to do it a couple of times? Eight, one, five, three, four, two. Yeah, Sydney, she's wrong. Is that what you got? Eight, one, five, three, four, two? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I got. Mine's a bigger than that. I don't know what it is. Okay, you got it. I thought I was supposed to add it. No, you are. It said add the. Add what? But she, Did he, he say she add pressed the equal. And then add it. Punch them all in all at once. Okay. <coughs> yeah, because you're then what you're doing is you're at squaring this, adding on that number, then squaring that great big huge number. That's right. That's right. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. That's how I remember it so there. Alright, so that's the sum of all these. That's one of our answers because what's that give us? If I remember from last time? What is that S? What's it stand for? Oh, we should have took that vocab test quiz today, uh, like I said. Sample. S stands for sample variance. Sample variance. Sample variance. So that's the variance. That's the variance. Now, one of the questions on the homework asks you, why is the variance not used as much as the standard deviation? We look at that number. Does that really help us any when we're talking about the male scores for SAT, 815,342. Does that really mean anything? No. Doesn't seem like it, right? So those are two of our answers.
What do we do to find S? What's S stand for? S squared stands for sample. Sample standard deviation. Boy, I hope you guys are we're getting into the hard stuff now. It's not going to be easy the rest of the day. What do we do with this number to find the standard deviation of this sample? So somebody do that. Take the square root of that number. 902.96. So 90, we'll say 903. So these are, actually they wanted the range too. We didn't find the range. What's the highest number in the set? 2120. What's the lowest number in the set? 1033. Subtract those two. 1087. Yeah. They wanted those four answers. What does that mean? What's all that? If we're looking at standard deviation for these males, number one, we know that the, the mean score is 1,643. So if Camden goes to take uh, the SAT, if he's about normal, he should expect to score about a what? 1643. All right? What does this standard deviation tell us? One way or the other, all right? So 341 is about how much each score is away from that mean score. All right, and we're gonna talk more about what that means, uh, what that tells us today. So write that down there, write, write this down and this down on your paper somewhere so that we have it here in a second. The 341 and the, no, the, sorry, I couldn't put the, the X bar, the 1643. So that's for males, 1643 is the mean and the standard deviation is 341. <coughs> See if we can do the females and I won't screw up so much this time. Females. We're going to do the same thing. We got X. 1263 is the lowest. Yeah. 
down. Tell me what the sum of all of our x's are. Again, if you wanted, maybe that's what we ought to do. You want to try putting them in the list so we can just do it all at once, or you want to do it out long again? I got Yeah. One, three, six. Seven three thirteen thousand six hundred seventy three. Yeah, that seem right. Yes. Now to find our <laughs> x bar, we take that number, divide by eight. Seventeen what? So we'll say seventeen oh nine. Just round it off. We should go out farther than that, but I'll just round it off so that we can look at it a little easier. So that's telling us that the mean score for females is 1709. Let's stop right there for a second. What did we say the mean score for males was? 1643. Right away, what's that tell us? Females do better on the SAT than males on average. All right? Does that mean that that's always going to be true? No. No, I'm sure there's you know, some male. If we went to all the SAT scores and in the whole country, nothing against you females, but I would almost guarantee if we found the highest SAT scores in the whole country, that number one, it's going to be a perfect score. There's going to be more males that have perfect scores than there are females. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, but I'm not saying that. So, so for this study, the females scored higher on average. If we go down through and we do this, uh, let's subtract these. So 1263 uh, minus 1709. Somebody do some of them from the bottom so we can. I got it. Now, one second before we go on. As we're going through and doing this, and they're giving me these scores, what could you guys be doing with them? Put that number in, square it, plus, and that way we can have it all done. What's the next one? 76. 163. 243. And 501. Again, we're not going to write all these numbers down. They're just too big. If it's smaller numbers, <coughs> Molly was in here yesterday for intervention, and I showed her one, and the one that we did out longhand, the smaller numbers wasn't too hard, right? I got 641. When you totaled it up? Yeah. 641, 375? Yeah. Is that what you more, more people got that? Anybody else get that? Got that? So we got at least... <laughs> a couple of people that got that. <coughs> now, once we have this sum, to find, this is one of our answers. To find the variance, we take that number and we divide by n minus 1. Well, n this time was 7 again, right? Or uh, 8, I mean. So 8 minus 1, which is 7. So what you've got to be careful of, is if, if you're plugging that into your calculator, if you're plugging that into your calculator, and you plug in 641, 375, divided by 8 minus 1, what's the calculator going to do? It's going to divide by 8, then subtract off the 1. Because it does its PEMDAS, its order of operations. So you've got to do the 8 minus 1 first, then a division. What was it again? Is that right? <coughs> 91625? That's our variance. How do we find the standard deviation? Take the square root of that. We'll say 303. 
Again, they also won the range. Somebody help me out. What was the range? I always forget about the range because it's so easy. Now let's just look at these. We wrote you wrote those down for the males. We've already decided the females on average score higher. What do you think this standard deviation? What was the standard deviation? This is for females. What was the standard deviation for males? 341. That's for the males. What do you think that tells us? Make up some kind of conjecture, some kind of idea about what this information tells us about males compared to females. <coughs> So not only are the female scores on average higher, they're closer together. So if we were looking at a graph, the female <coughs> graph might look something like that, where the male graph, my drawing's not very good. might look something more like that, where they're more spread out. Why might that be? That's true. We have a lot of males maybe going and taking this test. Not so much that they're stupid. My, my oldest son did this to me. Spend the, I don't even know what it was, <coughs> like 75 bucks or something to take the ACT. I, I think I think I paid more than that. You probably didn't do like the I probably, early, early pay. Yeah. That's probably. It. So it seems like it was like seventy-five dollars. I think with my oldest son, it was only like fifty dollars. But that was that was several years ago. So, um, but the first the first time I took him to take it, it was at Eaton, and he had to be there seven thirty in the morning or whatever on a Saturday. So what's he do? He goes out and he goes out and does something stupid Friday night. I don't know, you know, stayed out all night. Goes to take the ACT, scores like a 18 or something on it. And that wasn't good enough to get him into any of the schools that he wanted to go to. So I had to pay more money, but this time I was a little smarter because I said, no, 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 you're taking your butt to bed tonight so that you can get up and go take this test in the morning because I'm not paying for another one. It's ridiculous. Now, now I say that. I went and took the test. I think when I when I went and took the test, I think the the Saturday morning, I got home at like 3.30 in the morning. Got up at 6.30 and ran and took the test. Did you get it? Like I have, like you know how like for scholarship you said you have to have a certain GPA and then a certain ACT, ACT score. My GPA is way better than the GPA they require, but my ACT is not good. I just I'm not good at the ACT. Some things on the ACT. Number one, my score probably <coughs> wouldn't have been that high because English and history or uh, whatever they call it on there. But they have. They have. See, I don't even think. Science, writing, reading, math. The, the reading, the reading and the English part. The English part. I'm horrible. <laughs> right? I was hor I'm horrible at it. But some things you got to remember with the ACT, because the woman, I think at that time they were calling when you had like ten minutes left. To, to, huh? Yeah. Now it's they've changed it. See, I think yeah, when I was doing it, it was like I had ten. Like thirty questions. Yeah, so See, and that's what I did. I had more than 30. I can't. I, there was like 45 on the reading part. I'd done like 10. I thought oh, 10 minutes. See, I didn't do it as off, but I just can't read very fast. Does that make sense to everybody? Can everybody do that? Again, use your calculator.
Where'd your son get? The second time around. thing on top of the next one. Other questions on this stuff? You guys want to see any of these others? Want me to run down through some of the answers or something? Yeah. Go down. You just want me to go through them all? Yeah. Somebody help me out so I don't have to keep looking back at my book. What number one ask us? How to find the range, highest, minus, lowest. What, and I think it said what's good about the range, what's bad about the range. What's the thing? I just put a disadvantage. It could be an outlier. Right. If you have an outlier, it messes everything up. And the good thing about the range is it's easy and quick. Number two, what's it say? All right, so. <coughs> What's it say exactly? Because that, that explain how to find the deviation of the entry. Oh, okay. So I couldn't read my own writing. Data minus mean, right? You take each piece of data, subtract off the mean. That gives you the deviation. How much it deviates. That's what we were just doing up there. And if you added all those up, what should, number should you end up with? Zero. Zero. You should end up with zero if you add up all the deviations. Number three, uh, I think it said something about uh, what's, what's better about standard deviation than variance, right? And we're just looking at that up here. When we're getting our variance, we're getting like 116,000. Well, what's 116,000 got to do with a SAT score that only goes up to like 2,700 or whatever it goes up to? So. Uh, variance is always units squared. Standard deviation is regular units, so it actually fits a little better. Number four. Uh, so, what do you got to do to find the standard deviation? All right, square root of the variance. That's how they're related. Neither one of them can be negative. <coughs> 
If you come up with a negative standard deviation or a negative variance, you screwed up. Uh, number five, number five asks for, ask you to write a set of numbers where, what all did it say? And what equals zero? equals zero. So the standard deviation is zero. What's that telling you if the standard deviation is zero? How far is each number from? They're all the same. They're all the same. They're all right there at what number? Nine. So for that one, our set would be all nines. Seven of them. Number six, when they ask you to do stuff like on number six, it's just more <coughs> to get you to think a little bit. This is a set of numbers that would have worked. That's uh, at number six, yeah. I think that's why I don't want to Because number six asks you to find, at the standard deviation of two, there was six, n was six, and the mean was five. So that's a set of numbers that would work that would give us exactly those numbers. Nothing. Are there other sets of numbers that might give us exactly those same numbers? Yeah. Uh, number seven. Something that apparently Mr. Eversole didn't remember. What's the difference between the population variance and the standard deviation variance? Population variance, you do what? What do you have to, what's part of the formula? Divide by? Population is? In. And sample variance, you divide by what? N minus 1. Apparently I can't remember <coughs> because I screwed it up. Uh, number 8. What's the symbol for standard deviation if we're doing a population? Standard deviation if we're doing population? Sigma. What's the symbol for doing a sample? S. Uh, number 11. Again, could you punch all those numbers into the calculator if you wanted? Just put them in the list and it'll do all that stuff for you. All right? Does that mean I don't want you to know how to do it out longhand like we were just doing it? No, I want you to, because you got to understand what you're actually doing there. Uh, on 11, I got the the mu was 9, the variance was 4.8, uh, the standard deviation was 2.2, and the range was 7. Number 12, got, uh, mu was 19, range was 10, variance was 6.1, and standard deviation was 2.5. <coughs> 13, I got that the range was 15, uh, X bar was 12, we're dealing with, I'm using X bar now because we're dealing with samples. Standard deviation was, I'm sorry, the variance was 21.2 and standard deviation was 4.6. Something I forgot on this because if you do it on the calculator, it'll tell you what S is, it says SX, that's the standard deviation. To find the variance, to find the variance, you've got to take that number, whatever they give you, and square it, because the calculator doesn't tell you the variance. All right, so it's sort of backwards. Usually, we find the variance first, and then you take the square root to find the standard deviation. If you use your calculator and the list set up, then you got to you're going to find the standard deviation, and you got to square it to get the variance. Uh, 14, the range was 21, X bar was 18.3, variance was 44.9, and the standard deviation 6.7. 15, 15 through 18 days won the range. 15, 73, 16, 10, 17, 24, 
18, 6.2. 19, there was two parts and they won the range on both of them. Uh, on 19, part A, the range was 17.8. Then they took out one of the numbers and stuck in another number in its place. And what that do to the range? Made it a lot bigger. And the range is 39.8 on that one. And then on 20, they ask you about that. If you have an outlier, what's that do to the range? We're writing them up. Put it in What's an outlier do to the range? Makes it bigger. 21. Uh, on t problems like 21, we talked about that a second ago when we were talking about what the graphs look like. If you see a graph that looks like this, where does most of the data fall? Right there, right? That standard deviation is going to be smaller because when it's grouped together more like that, standard deviation is smaller. When it's more spread out, it's more spread out evenly, standard deviation is going to be bigger. So small standard deviation, when more of the stuff is right here, bigger standard deviation when it's more spread out. That's 20, what 21 and 22. Uh, was dealing with. 23, 23 is a good problem. On 23 it says you apply for jobs at two companies. Company A offers starting salaries. Uh, the average salary is 31000 and a standard deviation of 1000 Company B offers a starting salary of 31000 so the starting salaries or the average salaries are the same and has a standard deviation of 5000 For which company are you more likely to get paid $33,000 or more? How could you tell there if I had two companies, one of the companies, 33000 with a standard deviation of 1000 the other company, <coughs> average pay, 33000 but it has a standard deviation of 5,000. Which one are we more likely to get an offer from of 33,000? I say 31,000. I said 31 and wrote 33. So which one are we more likely to get an offer of 33,000 from? This is A, this is B. Yep. Now that's that's the average salary. It's not so much the starting salary. B, because with the standard deviation, that means that their salaries are more spread out. So it's more likely that they're going to get that. And what we're going to learn today is when you find the standard deviation, most all numbers fall within two standard deviations one way or the other of the mean. So if I'm looking at this, and this is something you're going to have to be able to do, do uh, for the homework tonight, be able to draw this. If my mean is 31,000, if I'm looking at this one, one standard deviation would put me at how much down here? 30,000. 30, Another standard deviation would put me at 29,000. Going up, 32,000, 33,000. What we're going to learn today is that almost all of this company's, if, if this is their mean and their standard deviation, almost all of their employees fall within that range. All right. What would the other one look like? Thirty-one thousand in the middle. Thirty-six thousand. 
36,000 over here, then what? 41,000. Down here, what? 26. 21. So for company B, this is company B, there's like 97% of all their salaries are going to fall in this range. 97% for company A is going to fall in that range. Which company is it more likely that we're going to get an offer greater than $33,000 for? B. B. Well, probably, is company A going to offer anybody more than $33,000? Probably not. It's a very low percentage. one and a half percent. Uh, 24 was same, <coughs> same as the other one. If a golfer has a standard deviation of 1.2 strokes, that means that normally they're right there in that certain range all the time. They're right there close to Everything's close every time they do something. On your notes from last time, check this out. I put this on this PowerPoint last year and I'm not sure why. It might be because I messed up last time and didn't tell you the right order. I don't think so, but does this look exactly the same as last the one we did last time? No difference. So make sure you got that down. If you didn't get it last time, you might want to get it right now. Have out your notes. We're going to go over a bunch of this stuff real, real quickly because we've only got like 25 minutes. stuff we did last time so I'm going to skip through this. If we were using our calculator, just show you on the calculator, you could punch all those in. Instead of doing it out longhand like we did, when you get a longer list, probably easier to punch it into the calculator. Calculator last time we talked about, what's x bar again? That's the mean. What's that? Sum of all of them. What's the s? Standard deviation, if it's a sample, what's the sigma? Standard deviation, if it's population, what's in? How many items, how many pieces of data we have? So on, so on, all the way down through there. We talked about this last time, standard deviation's always got to be positive. It tells you how much it's being spread this last time too. Again, standard deviation, if it looks like this, what's the standard deviation? Zero. There is no standard deviation. I shouldn't say that. There is a standard deviation at zero, but none of them deviate from the mean. A little more spread out, standard deviation sort of low, wider spread out, standard deviation gets higher. Those are all the symbols. We wrote these down last time, right? U, X bar, sigma, S, S squared, sigma squared. Variance for population, variance for a sample, standard deviation uh, for a population, standard deviation for a sample. Oh yeah, I forgot. SSX is the symbol for these down here, some of those, both of those actually on the bottom. 
U is for a population, X bar is for a sample, big N is for a population, little n is for a sample. We're gonna, what we're going to talk about today, these three rules, range rule, empirical rule, <coughs> Chebyshev's rule. The first one, the range rule. Range rule is pretty, pretty easy. We won't use range rule a whole lot because range rule is sort of an estimate. Range rule for most data sets. Now notice it says most data sets. Not everything fits into all these rules. For most data sets, the majority of data lies within two standard deviations of the mean. So if we take that standard deviation, add it to the mean twice like we were just doing there with the 31,000, most of the data is going to fall within two standard deviations above or below the mean. To get sort of an estimate of that, we could use this range rule right here. And this is the range rule. To get that estimate, the range is always going to equal four times standard deviation. So if we take four times the standard deviation, that should give us the range of the data. That should tell us how far it is between the high and the low of the data. Now the thing that might be a little more useful, instead of going through all that stuff and making that big chart or punching everything into our calculator, if we just wanted a quick <coughs> look at what is the standard deviation of this set of data, we could use this, this formula. Standard deviation is going to equal the range divided by 4. So if I give you a set of numbers, I give you that set of numbers, we find the range, 7 minus 1, and we get 6. Divide that by 4, 1.5. Our standard deviation for that set of numbers, without going through all that stuff that we were just doing, it's going to be somewhere around 1.5. That gives us a good estimate of the standard deviation. Not an exact number, but a, a decent estimate. That's the range rule. We don't use the range rule a whole lot because you have a calculator, and we're going to, we can do a lot of this stuff on the calculator, so we don't want to give an estimate. We want to know precise numbers. Uh, a sample of women's heights has a mean of 64 inches and a standard deviation of 2.5 inches. Using the range rule, uh, most women fall within what two heights? So if we're using the range rule, what we can do with that, so if we go back to this real quick, range high minus low, range is four times the standard deviation. We know the standard deviation is that, so we times that by 4. What's 2.5 times 4? So that tells us that our range should be 10. So if I'm looking at, we said the average woman has a height of 64 inches. What's that going to go down to if our range is 10? Be careful. 59. Why 59? Goes 5 on this side, 5 on that side. How high is it going to go up to? So, because your range, yeah. high minus low, right? So, what height do we expect all women to fall between? 59 and 69 inches. So, give me a height that would be unusual for a, a young lady. 70 inches would be unusual. So, 
you have a young lady and she's 70 inches tall, that's a little unusual. Skip over this one. Empirical rule. Uh, don't do that, don't do that. The empirical rule uses this. 68, 95, 99.7. Those are key numbers. About 68% of the data lie within one standard deviation. Guess what the 95 stands for? Within two. And then 99.7 within <coughs> three. This is going to be, when we look at this, it's going to be symmetric. It's going to make what's called a bell curve or a bell-shaped distribution. So it's going to look like this. My bells won't always look symmetric, but just deal with it. This is the empirical rule. Splits it up this way. If our mean is right here, right in the middle, one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below is going to be 68% of all the data. We go out here, another standard deviation away from the mean on each side, and it's going to be 95% of the data. We go out one more standard deviation, and we're going to be at 99.7% of the data. That leaves just a very little bit that falls outside of three standard deviations. That's the empirical rule. This is the rule that we're going to use the most. Something along those lines. We'll actually talk a little bit about the bell curve and how it's separated and stuff. That's going to be what we're going to use the most. What percent of the data should fall from on right here in this box I'm getting ready to color in? And guess? That little box right there. 34. So this is two standard deviations. If I'm just looking at the standard deviation above the mean, should be 34%. What percent of the data should fall on that side of the mean. Fifty percent, right? What percent should fall on this side of the mean? Fifty percent. Could we figure out what percent falls from here over? Yeah, and that's sort of what the next slides are going to show us. Sixty-eight percent, ninety-five percent, ninety-nine point seven percent. That's the empirical rule. It's basically the same thing as as a bell curve, but we're gonna a bell curve will have just a little, a little different <coughs> percentages. So sixty-eight percent falls in there. Notice down here at the bottom it says x bar minus s. Somebody read that to me in words. What's x? Mean minus standard deviation. So you take the mean, subtract one standard deviation. That gives you this box right here. You take the mean and you add one standard deviation. That gives you that box. And that box right there should be a total of how, what percentage? 68%. 68% of the data should fall in that range. Next one, these little parts, one more standard deviation out each way is going to put us at 95%. Well, each one of these two is going to be 13.5. So if on the next quiz or test, I say, what percentage of the data falls in that part right there, you're going to say 13.5%.
And then if we add on the last one, there's another 2.4 on each side. Then out here, you have those outliers on each end. That's about 0.1%. Those are the people who score, like on the SAT, those are the people who score perfect scores that fall way out there. So that's the way it's broke up. This might be a good thing to have drawn in your thing right there, the way this is set up. 2.4%, 13.5, 34, 34, 13.5, 2.4, and point one on each end. We will not deal with data that's usually more than three standard deviations away. Most of that stuff that's more than three <coughs> standard deviations away from the mean <coughs> isn't something that we deal with. This bell curve right here very, very important for the rest of the year. Same, same setup here. You got your X bar, one standard deviation below, one standard deviation above, two below. Two above, three below, three above. When on your homework, what you're going to have to do is they're going to tell you x bar equals five. Then you're going to put five right here in the middle. And maybe they tell you that the standard deviation is two. So you're going to have to draw a graph of this. Where's that first uh, standard deviation going to fall out on that side? Seven. How about the one on this side? Three. One on this side? Nine. One on this side? One. So on, so on. And if they ask you what percent of all the data falls between three and five? Thirty-four percent. Maybe they ask you what percent falls in between three and nine? You got 34 there, you got another 34 there. What was this one? 13.5%. You add all those up and that tell you how much falls in that range. here, 34%, 13.5%, they were looking at those two together. They're probably looking at like this part right here. What percent of the people fall within that range? 47.5%. Chebyshev's theorem. Make sure you write down this formula. That's his theorem. Portion of any data set lying within k standard deviations, where k has to be greater than 1, is always 1 minus 1 over k squared. So this is going to give you a portion or the percent of data that falls in that range. However many standard deviations above or below you're going. K equals 2 in any data set, at least. So if we do 1 minus 1 over 2 squared, that's what the theorem tells us to do. 2 squared is 4. 1 minus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. So 75%, Chebyshev said 75% of all data is going to fall within two standard deviations of the mean. This is sort of like the thumb rule, sort of gives us an idea that, hey, this is the way it should work. Now, Chebyshev's theorem works for all data. The empirical rule only works for those data that actually fits the bell curve, 
right? So this should work for any set of data, even if the data, maybe when you graph it, maybe it looks like this, where it's skewed to the right. This is still supposed to work. All the, uh, or 75% of the data should fall within two standard deviations either way. K equals three. Then Chebyshev said that 88.9% is going to fall within three standard deviations. Again, this works for any set of data, not just a bell curve, not just the symmetrical stuff. A lot of things in the real world don't fit the standard or the normal curve. might be skewed to the right or skewed to the left. So if you wanted to write down something about Chebyshev's two standard deviations, 75%. Three standard deviations, 88.9%. We did four. That'd be 4 squared is 16, 1 minus that would be 15 16. Somebody help me out with your calculator. What's 15 divided by 16? 29.375. So for four standard deviations, it'd be almost 94% of the data falls within it. Notice here, doesn't fit a normal bell curve, so we use Chebyshev's on that. If we're doing a frequency distribution, this formula is what we'd have to use. So you do all the same stuff, but you multiply this by the frequency. So you multiply this, you might want to write down this formula. This is find the standard deviation for a frequency distribution. It's not really all that difficult, and we won't do a whole lot with it, but we, we probably will do a couple things with it. Still the same formula, it's just before you add, you multiply by how many of them there are in that set. So if we have our frequency here, and the frequency is 5 for the first set, then we square it and we multiply by 5 before we add them all up. The next set is three, we square it, multiply by three. Remind me, we'll, we'll try to do one of these next time for sure, just to show you how to do it for sure. It's not really all that much more difficult than the other. It's just instead of listing all the numbers out separately, you're doing it. Hey, I have five twenties. I got three seventeens. I got two nineteens. One more formula, so make sure you don't put everything away yet. Coefficient of variation, CV. I write that down. I'm going to give you the formula here as soon as I find it. There it is. Can't hardly read this. I'm going to rewrite it over here. For some reason my PowerPoint's messing up. You got sigma divided by mu times 100%. So that's if you're dealing with the population. Coefficient of variation for a sample is S divided by X bar times 100%. So you find the standard deviation, you find the mean, you divide those two times it by 100, that gives you the coefficient of variation. And what that does, it sort of describes the uh, standard deviation as a percentage. 
and then you can compare males to females like we had on that first thing. We could actually compare two different groups and say, okay, the, the females are at 40%, the males are at 30%. So we could actually compare. So those two formulas, population, sample.